tonight we update the fight against one of the South's major pests. Find out what's causing our coastal fishermen some major worries. And join the country's top floral artists in Invercargill. Good evening. News tonight of some major restructuring in the 32 pest destruction boards in Otago and Southland. It was learned today that the boards are about to undergo a drastic amalgamation and that there may be tighter controls to come. Michael Lynch reports that the move comes at a time when Otago farmers are scratching their heads over what to do about a worsening rabbit problem. Rabbits, once again, are running riot in parts of central Otago. And, once again, farmers are wondering what to do about them. Today's Provincial Otago Farmers Conference was urged to try a new tack and call on the government to commercialise rabbiting. I really think that until we do have a new approach, people aren't going to be motivated to look for the answers. And what we believe that in a commercial world, people will look for those answers and they'll find them. But John Metherall's suggestion found no favour. The next question will be, we'll have to dispense with poisons. In a lot of areas we haven't had good poisons, but in other areas the poisons have been very, very effective and we can't afford to lose the few weapons we've got. Yet pest destruction experts admit poison simply isn't working in the worst areas. And their solutions, as ever, are more drastic. I have got no real faith in us finding a method, but we are told by government and by the people of New Zealand that we're not allowed to use maximatosis and there must be other ways so if people go off their properties waiting to find something, as far as people in New Zealand are concerned, it doesn't really matter. But, like it or not, pest boards are about to have their wings clipped. Legislation just activated or cut the South's 32 pest boards to five. Two coastal boards, Waitaki, Central Otago and Southland. Future local body amalgamation may cut them further and see pest and weed control combined. And meanwhile, the rabbits keep breeding. And many downcountry farmers are sick of subsidising what they say is not their problem. I, I believe that if rabbits are a national problem, and I believe they are in places, um, we've got to keep our soil conserved, that the people of all the cities, and that means Auckland City, should be paying that bill as well. For it's a problem that won't go away. We have got to change our poisons, our methods somehow and uh, we have certainly haven't got any answers. We've still got the taxpayer input for this year and provisionally for next year. After that, if uh, we are not making significant progress, I think we're going to have to once again ask the government to consider the most cost-effective option, which isn't acceptable to the majority of the people at the moment, maximatosis. An Invercargill High Court jury today took just 44 minutes to find Ellen Elvis Sands guilty of murdering his 16-year-old girlfriend in Queenstown last year. The four-day trial was told Sands shot the girl through the forehead, then turned the gun on himself. But the bullet glanced off the 46-year-old's skull and he was out of hospital in two days. A fight's on to keep at least one of the lighthouse keepers in the south who's due to lose his job shortly. A petition's been launched in South Otago to keep the Nugget Point lighthouse manned. It's one of three lighthouses in the south where the Ministry of Transport's decided the keeper can be replaced by technology. Bernard Buck with the details. Alan Martin's life at the Nugget Point lighthouse will be over at the end of this year. He's the first of the region's three keepers to be given a finishing date and he's not happy about it. He's been keeper at Nugget Point for the past six years and at one time looked out for the lighthouse on Dog Island in Fovo Strait. It's a job Ellen Martin believes is essential to maritime safety. From the safety aspect, particularly the islands, I feel should be manned. Uh, Dog Island and Centre Island, they're uh, pretty remote down there. There's a lot of boating activity, small boats going around. Nugget Point Lighthouse has been automated since the early 80s. But Alan's been there filing reports on sea and weather conditions and keeping in touch with local fishermen. Removing the keepers means that part of the service will go. Alan Martin says that's a mistake and goes against the Commission of Inquiry finding back in 1981. We have the fishing camp down below there. Those chaps prefer to have somebody up here just to keep an eye on them in case things go wrong. Uh, we have quite a number of calls from 
the fishermen at Port Chalmers. They might be in passage between here and Bluff or even just coming down to fish. They'll get in touch with me to see what weather conditions are like. Peter Anderson has been fishing in the south for the past 20 years. The prospect of a local lighthouse operating without a keeper is something that worries him. I think it's very important because uh, if they go automation, they can't give you the, they only give you the, the wind conditions and everything else. They can't give you the sea swell and everything else. And if anybody ever gets into any trouble, the lighthouse keeper is always on the job. I do not think that they can take the human element away and replace it with uh, automation. Will you support this local lighthouse keeper in his petition? Yes, I will, because I think that the government now is putting more emphasis on dollars and cents than they are on the human factor. Alan Wright says that apart from his caretaker role, there are other reasons for staffing the lighthouse. He says throughout the year it's visited by schools and nature groups who need to be shown over the place. His only hope now is that the petition will strongly reflect local support and perhaps persuade the government to change its mind. The Otago Law Society is still at odds with its national body. At a meeting today, the local branch expressed pleasure that an out-of-pocket couple featured recently on Fair Go have received their money in a settlement funded by Broadbank. The Otago lawyers say they acknowledge the part played in this by the society but have asked local members for contributions because they believe the couple still haven't been fully compensated. Elderly residents at Kelvin Heights, the retirement suburb of Queenstown, are up in arms about possible residential development on a 30-hectare recreation reserve. To complicate matters further, as Michael Lynch reports, the reserve's smack in the middle of a possible future route to the new Queenstown airport. Kelvin Heights has become quite the place to retire to over the last 20 years. But the grandparents living here are just sitting back and letting life roll by. They've been a thorn in the side of the local authority from time to time, and more lately over a little known reserve they want preserved intact for posterity. Nestled in behind the houses in the lake is 30 hectares of prime building land. In a review of the district scheme, a potential residential classification was put on part of it. The local authority says there's no immediate intention of opening it up, but the Kelvin Heights residents aren't entirely convinced. A lot of things are done within the whole of New Zealand, everywhere, I suppose, for expediency's sake. And this is something that we don't want to see, things done for expediency's sake. We want to see this retained for posterity. Mrs Binney and a group have already planted ornamental trees on the site. Their children's children will be middle-aged before the trees mature. It's been done quietly, but nevertheless with dedication. And complicating all this is the proposed site for the new Queenstown Airport, right at the lake edge of the Remarkables Valley. The ultimate route to the airport could involve a bridge or a tunnel from Queenstown to Kelvin Heights and then on through the reserve. There's been a lot of talk about bridges across there, a lot of controversy about it. I think a lot of people would go off like a cracker. The residents' worries have been termed pure speculation by Queenstown councillors. And that comment doesn't lessen their determination to keep the issue alive. Now a preview of some of that floral art as we catch up on today's three o'clock temperatures. Half Moon Bay was sunny and nine degrees. Invercargill partly cloudy and ten. Gore sunny and eight degrees. Buckleutha sunny and eight. Dunedin fine and eleven degrees. Palmerston sunny and the high today of twelve. Omaru sunny and eleven. Kurao clear and nine, ran fairly fine and five. Queenstown fine, the low of two degrees today. Wanaka fine and five, and Alexandra fine, but also sharing that low with Queenstown of two degrees. Tayano sunny and six. And the expected highs for tomorrow are Dunedin eleven, and in Vicargo nine degrees. The Omaru Public Libraries, the first in the South Island, where a borrower can use a computer to find a book. The long rows of dusty drawers holding index cards have gone. And as George Burke discovered, even someone of minimum intelligence can use the new system. The library has more than 45,000 books and other items on its shelves, and details of these have been programmed into computers which are available to the public. To find a book, it's simply a case of following the instructions on the screen.
You don't even have to know the name of the book or the author, as the computer will make a search of the catalogue once it's been given a keyword such as a subtitle or subject. And the computer has other applications which the community is finding helpful. The high school teachers have suddenly realised that we can print out any section of the catalogue on paper for them. So we've got the economics teacher asking for the piece they want, the history teacher asking for the section, and we're sending off book lists off to Girls High to those teachers every day. And it, I think there's a big potential in doing this. And the Invercargill Library has plans to put its catalogue on computer when it moves to new premises next year. But the Dunedin Public Library has no plans for the immediate future. Another of the success stories from North Otago in recent times has been the opening of the Waitaki Community Recreation Centre in Omaru. It's being fully utilised by sports and leisure groups and was the ideal venue for a huge Chinese banquet held during the recent Whitestone Chinese Festival. Here's George again. The one and a half million dollar complex has been open since the beginning of the year and its use has gradually built up. It's shared with neighbours, Waitaki Girls High School, who use the gymnasium. There's an enormous amount of room for all indoor sports like badminton, basketball, weight training and, believe it or not, mountaineering. The indoor rock faces are popular in the off-season. Aerobics classes are popular too. With all the activities going on at the centre, one wonders where they all took place before it was built. Yes, it does actually. We had a lot of other older halls that people made use of. Yes. It's a marvellous facility really, like, you know, we're getting full public use. It's a great asset to the town really. We've got the school in during the daytime, we've got the public here just about every night of the week. And Jan says the centre's working on a marketing plan to attract more business, including conferences and trade fairs. I didn't spot George at the aerobics class, did you? The scent and beauty of floral art is delighting visitors to Ascot Park in Invercargill. The arrangements are courtesy of the Floral Arts Society of New Zealand, which is holding its annual conference for the first time in the city. The 200 delegates brought their concerns to the conference and their own material for an array of stunning arrangements around the theme of our natural resources. The get-together's traditionally been a time for planning and sharing ideas. But the cost of getting 200 delegates together forced the conference to look hard this year at new ways of utilising delegates' time. And while they were busy planning their arrangements, society members have also been preparing a case to put to government on the value of the arts in modern society. Well, sometimes we feel that sport comes first. For instance, our society pays income tax, and we know of many sports groups throughout New Zealand who don't pay any tax at all, and yet they have very successful bar trading and other means of raising money. So there are a lot of concerns that are facing voluntary organisations, are facing the arts generally, where um, they are just as important to people with increasing leisure, with unemployment. We are looking at ways of helping people to use their spare time profitably and to enjoy their leisure activities, to become involved in the art scene just as much as they should become physically fit and out on the sports field. Another of the society's projects is to launch a collection of seeds and plants in spring to help victims of Cyclone Bola re-establish their gardens. But in spite of the devastation, Gisborne was represented. They chose wool and the vine to illustrate the region's natural resources. Wellington chose honey, if that's what flows from the beehive. And from New Zealand's thermal wonderland, this creation. Nelson Marlborough artists took salt as the inspiration for their piece.
and from Otago, yellow chrysanthemums to represent the province's foundation on gold. Tomorrow night, floral artists will demonstrate to the public how it's done. Some beautiful work, and I hope that you get a chance to see the display. That's all from us tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>